and welcome all of our campuses tuning in with us live right now. Not only our online campus, but Discovery Northwest, our Dream Center, Teen Challenge, as well as different counseling centers all across Bakersfield. Come on, will you right there just celebrate? Welcome them to Southwest. Welcome them. Let's go. We're excited you're here. Along the, the ride and the journey that God has for us, we've been in a series called Summer at Discovery. Summer is always a unique season. It's a, it's a fun season. There's all kinds of stuff for the youth. They have Summer Oasis coming up, their own little... They didn't get to go on a camp because of COVID, but it's their own version of camp right here in Bakersfield on campus. Really excited about that. Summer blast for the kids. They had a great time, man. And, and we have Serve Day coming up. There's just a whole bunch of things that we do every summer for families and our community to serve and, and reach out. And so in this season and series, it's really not a series, it's a season, what we're doing is we're taking an opportunity to just speak to relevant needs every week of what God is doing in our world, what God is doing in our city, what God is doing in our lives, and, and just asking God to speak through it all. And I'm excited to share with you what God put on my heart here and what is, I think, part five of Summer at Discovery. And, and what I want to talk to you about is the struggles, trials, and valley experiences that all of us go through. We go through trouble and trial. We're experiencing kind of a, a prolonged struggle, a back and forth yo-yo. What, what is up with that? What is, what, what's going on with all of that in the, in, from God's perspective? And then how do we handle the seasons of struggle, the seasons of of low, what I'm calling today the valley experiences, because we love the mountains, but how many of you know we, we often find ourselves in the valley of life as well? I want to talk to you about that today and take you on this journey of what God has to say about that through a few different stories. In fact, the first one I want to share with you, it comes out of 1 Kings um, chapter 20. It was about 2,900 years ago, there was this king in Israel named Ahab, and the Syrian army decided to go to war against Israel. But what he did is he got 32 other kings to rally against Israel and, and try to conquer and defeat Israel. But God miraculously comes to their rescue and defeats these 32 kings against one Israel nation. But then one year later, they decide, no, 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 we're going to go back, okay, and, and let's go back and try it again. But what they did is they looked at their battle strategy from the last time that they were defeated, and they said, we need to do something different this time. So in 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 23, it says, meanwhile, the officials of the king of Aram, that's the king that came against the king of Israel, they advised him. He's, <laughs> this is what they said. Their gods, Israel's God, are the gods of the hills. That is why they were too strong for us last time. But if we fight them on the plains, surely we will be stronger than they. So they, they said, we just need a new battle strategy. Because when we fought them, we fought them on a mountain. We fought them in the hills. But their, their God is a God of hills and mountains. Let's get down lower where their God isn't. <laughs> Let's fight them there. And so, and so they got uh, over, a, over 100,000 troops against the Israelite army. And in fact, it goes on to say in the same chapter, verse 27, it says the Israelites camped opposite of them, and they were like two small flocks of goats, while the Arameans covered the countryside. It, it, the, the Israelites had about 7,000 soldiers. And so they're camped out in this plain, in this valley, uh, against uh, over 100,000 chariots and soldiers, and it looks like defeat is inevitable. There's no way that they're going to survive this, get around this. There's no way. This is just insurmountable. But then God speaks. He says this in verse 28. God says, because the Syrians think that I am only the God of of the hills, if they, th they think that I'm only the God of the mountains and not that I am the God of the valleys. Today, the, the title of my message is The God of the Valleys. How many, how many know that God is not just the God of your mountaintop experiences, He's also the God of your valleys? He's not just the God of your good times, the God of your happy times, the God of your smooth sailing. He's also the God when things don't look like they're going the way they should be. He's also the God in the pandemic. He's also the God in the pain. He's also your God in the loss and in the grief. Can I get a better amen? 
He says, hey, because they think I only exist in those mountains and I'm not the God of the valleys. I'm going to give you a victory over this huge army so everyone will know that I am the Lord. We serve a God who takes us not only to mountaintop experiences, and we all enjoy those. The problem is we get addicted to them. And we come thinking, and we think that to serve God and to follow God is somehow a mountaintop that we serve a God that is a mountain experience God. And if I'm not experiencing the mountain, then I must not be with God. But you need to know that your God, the God that, that you serve, the God of the Bible, is not just the God of the mountaintop experiences. You can't just go from experience to experience. You can't just go from Sunday to Sunday. You can't go from conference to conference to conference. You can't. You serve a God who will take you to the mountain but will lead you in the valley. We serve the God of the valleys. So let me, let me share with you, I want to share with you what we know about valleys. Valleys in the Bible, anytime there's a valley in the Bible, it's always like metaphorical. There's always a reason. Like every valley that's named in the Bible, it has an intentional name because of the purpose or the spiritual purpose or what the experience of that valley was you got to know that valleys in the bible they're always a type and a shadow there that there's always a connection there so what do we know about valleys and then i want to help you for anyone who is experiencing at any of our campuses or here online anywhere that's joining us we have like 10 countries joining us today anyone that's experiencing a valley if you're in a low if you're experiencing loss if you're experiencing grief or trouble or hardship i want to tell you as well what do you do when you're in the valley how do you get through the valley experiences we serve the god of the valley so first what do we know you need to know you need to know these things about valleys here if you're taking notes write these down number one that valleys are a part of life you guys valleys are a part of life in other words they're inevitable they're normal to life you cannot avoid them they're going to be ha- they're going to happen so don't be shocked don't be surprised when, when pain or struggle, okay, is, you, you, you just can't, it's not on the mountaintop alone. You got to learn how to handle the valleys. The only question that you should be asking when you're going through a valley is not like, like, why me? It's just, why not me, okay? You're not going through a valley because you did something bad. You're going through a valley because you're human. It's a part of life. In life, you will have disappointments. You will have defeat. You will have distractions and disturbances and de- despair and depression. Can I tell you this? God's plan for your life is to actually take you through mountains and valleys. That's his plan for your life. And I know we don't like it, but I'm telling you his plan is good. It's good. Deuteronomy chapter 11 actually says it like this, that he, the promised land, talking to the Israelites, the promised land where I'm leading you, uh, you're about to enter is a land of hills and valleys. You see, even when you're at the center of God's will, when you're in the center of his promises, that, that even if you're claiming all the promises of God, uh, they're all yes and amen in Christ. Even there, you're going to experience valleys. There still will be valleys. The apostle Peter said it like this in 1 Peter chapter 4. Don't be surprised when you're tested by troubles or painful suffering as if something unusual is happening to you, okay? You're having a problem in your life, not because you're a bad human. You just have problems because you are a human. It's a part of life. Even the promised land has valleys. Here's the second thing you need to know about valleys, and that is valleys happen to everybody. Valleys happen to everybody. So there's no way to avoid them. They're inevitable, but not only are they inevitable, check this out, they're impartial. They're impartial. Good things happen to bad people, and bad things happen to good people. Valleys are impartial. Psalm 34, 19 says it like this. The good man, oh, you think you're good in that you obey God, you follow all the rules, and that somehow insulates you or isolates you from from valleys even the good man does not escape all trouble he has them too but here's the promise the lord helps them in each and every one a lot of people a lot of people go i got a problem in my life god is punishing me 
No, 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 no. God's not punishing you. It's just part of being a human in this. Look, we live in a world that is broken, that is fallen, and you will have problems. No human is immune, is insulated, can avoid the problem. No one sells through life problem free. No one is exempt. In fact, in Matthew, Jesus goes on to say, I don't have the scripture in your handouts, but he goes on to say that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. The sun shines on the just and unjust alike. In fact, I was talking just the other day with a couple, and the, and, and the woman we were talking to, she had experienced cancer. And we're talking about this exact verse. She's on the other end of it now, cancer-free, thank you, God. But it was a long journey. We were talking about this because she had times where she cried out to God and said, wait a second, God, wait a second, God, this doesn't seem right. I read the Bible, it doesn't seem right. But God took her through this experience, and on the other end, she says, God is still good. Amen. Valleys, look, a faithful woman of God. She doesn't mean she's a bad person. She's just a human living in a broken, fallen world. Valleys happen to everybody. Here's the next thing. Valleys are unpredictable. They're unpredictable. That's what makes them really hard, right? The problems that come is like you can't plan for them. Like nobody planned for the COVID-19. All the plans you have are jacked up. They got wiped out, okay? But no one can plan for, for the disaster or the valley. It catches you off guard. In fact, when valleys and problems and troubles come, it often happens at the worst time it's like man it's like this it's it everything was just going good have you ever noticed how a good day can like how fast it can turn into a bad day just like like one phone call is all it takes one calamity one disaster or one one accident it can come quickly and none of us knows what's going to happen later this evening let alone tomorrow or the next day or the day after that in an instant everything can change that's why it says in psalm 27 don't ever brag about tomorrow, since you don't know what the day will bring forth. See, valleys are inevitable, they're impartial, they're unpredictable, but I want to go a little bit deeper today, and I want to teach you how valleys have a purpose. Valleys have a purpose. God has a purpose for your valley. You know, have you ever been caught in an undertow? For those of you that don't know what an undertow is, an undertow is, is where the the surface of the water is moving one direction, but what's happening underneath, the water, here's the literal definition, the definition of an undertow, a strong current of water beneath the surface that is moving in a different direction. So, so here's, here's, can I tell you like a purpose of the, of the valley and what God often does by taking us a little bit lower, by getting beneath the surface of things, because it looks like on the surface things are going in the right direction. Come on, I'm preaching to somebody. It looks like on the surface that things are going in the right direction, but underneath, there, it's going in the opposite way. There's some struggles. There's some trials. There's some things that you knowingly know that are going on over there, but there are some things that are even hidden to you, some things that are going the wrong direction. They're not going towards the will of God, towards your destiny, towards your purpose. It's an undertow that's happening, and what happens is as you get a little bit lower and you go to the valley, all that stuff on the surface is stripped away, and what you see is, oh my goodness. A lot of times the valleys and the valleys, your true self comes out. The things that are hidden come out. The anger, the frustration, the pride, the arrogance, the hurt, the pain begins to surf. You say, where did that come from? It was always there. It was just an undertow. It was an undertow. And God wants you to deal with it in the valley. See, he can't let, you can't see it in the mountain, so sometimes he's got to take you lower to get you a little bit deeper to see the things that are happening underneath. I, I read this research from Lifeway Research Group, did this study. At the, uh, a couple months into the stay-at-home order, they, they did a study of Christians, normal church-going, like average church-going Christians. They wanted to know what effect the stay-at-home order and isolation was having on believers, and they did a lot of study on this. It was really interesting, but one of the things that they found, it, it just, it irked me so much. And they found that that 36% of the normal church-going, like consistent church-going Christians, 36% of them during the stay-at-home months never attended church or watched online once. A third of them and, and what we're, and I might be preaching to the choir right now because you're like online or you're here or you're at a 
campus, but here's, here's, here's what we have found in, in the valley that we all find ourselves in around the world is that one third of professing believers found that, that, that there was things underneath that were going in the wrong direction. That some Christians are actually treating this pandemic as a vacation. I've even heard that. It's a vacation. I'm just taking a break and I'm just like, I'm going to, my goodness. That's not the reason for the valley, I promise you. I promise you, yes, there's rest. Yes, there is a reprioritization, sure. But the reason for your valley is not for you to distance yourself from God. God has a purpose in your valley. Let me give you a few scriptures. Romans chapter 5 says that we can even rejoice in our suffering, in our pain, in our valleys, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And he says that kind of hope doesn't disappoint us because God has poured out his love in our hearts. God has a purpose for the valley. He wants to do something in and through the valley in our life. In fact, in Hosea chapter 2, he says, I'll transform that valley of trouble you're going through into a gateway of hope. Can I get an amen right there? That, that valley of trouble is a literal valley. It's the valley of Achor is what it is. And, and it was, it was, you find it in Joshua. It was the valley they called the valley of trouble. And God is saying, look, that trouble that you're going through, that valley of trouble and disaster, whatever that is, if you allow me to, I'll make it be a gateway. As you go through it, you'll end up in hope, in hope. And I hope to give you some hope today. I hope God speaks to you today and gives purpose to your pain and to your, to your valley experiences. I've been reading the Psalms a lot, and there's actually a lot about in the valleys of you know, there's a lot of those metaphors in the psalm, and I want to give you a couple of them, and then we're going to study them, and I'm going to give you some application of what to do when you're in the valley. But Psalm 84 is a very beautiful psalm. I only have like a few, I think like verse 5, 6, or 7 inside of your handouts, but let me start actually in verse 1 and just take you on this journey of Psalm 84. He says, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints. Don't you love the language of the passion of the Psalms? That they just, they so, they, they just desire the presence of God for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out, come on, for not a, not a dead God, not a yesterday God, but a living God. You serve a God who does not sleep or slumber. He is a living God. And he says, even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young, a place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. And then he says, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength, they find it not in themselves or in this world or because things are going right. Blessed are those whose strength is found in you. And then he says this, whose heart is set on a journey. Whose, whose heart is set on a, on a pilgrimage that, that, that I don't get stuck. I don't stay still. I don't get paralyzed. Uh, my heart is set on this journey, on a pilgrimage of getting closer to God. And he says this, that as they pass through the valley of Baca was a literal valley that the pilgrimage, the Israelites would pass through this, as they were getting, going to Jerusalem, towards the presence of God, they would pass through this valley of Baca, and that word Baca means grief, this valley of grief, and they called it the valley of grief because there were these trees that, that, that oozed sap from their bark, it just looked like the trees were crying, and so they called this the valley of, of grief. And so they said, even, it is, even as we pass through this valley of grief, as I pass through my loss and my suffering and my pain and my, and my financial crisis and the collapses, he says, I'm not going to allow that to dictate, no, even here, I'm going to make that a spring and the autumn rains also cover it with pools. He says, if I'm going to have to travel through this valley, I might as well make a pool. Start digging. Start digging some ditches. If we gotta, if we gotta live in the valley, okay, here in the valley, how many got a pool? How many got a pool? Okay, if you gotta live in the valley, it's good to have a pool. Okay, that's what they're saying. They're like, if we gotta pass through the valley, is we might as well swim, baby. Let's go. Let's. Here's what he says. Here's they go 
from strength to strength. They go from strength to strength. You see, the, in the valley, in my grief, in my pain, listen, listen, I'm getting stronger in the Lord. My, I'm getting stronger in my faith. I'm getting stronger in my character and my calling. See, the enemy thought that you would be weak in the valley. Oh, my goodness. The enemy thought he would take you out in the valley, but he didn't know that God's best work is done in the valley, that in your weakness, God's strength is perfected. Come on, shout. I'm getting stronger. I'm getting stronger. See, this valley ain't going to take me out. It has purpose. I'm getting stronger in this valley. I'm going from strength. God wants to take me on a journey. He wants to take me on a pilgrimage, man. I'm on a journey. from This grief, I may have to go through the grief. I may have to go through the pain. I'm going to have to go through the loss and the difficulty and the disappointments. But I'm going to go from strength to strength. I'm going to go from glory to glory. I'm going to pass through this thing. And I love the journey, the journey Till each appears, go back, till each appears before God in Zion. Zion is a metaphor in the Bible. It's a place, but it's a metaphor often in the Psalms for the presence of God. He says, hey, I'm not stopping in this valley. I'm not going to sit here in this valley. No, I'm going, I'm on a journey here. I'm on a pilgrimage. I'm going from strength to strength until I get to the presence of God. Come on, somebody say, I'm getting stronger. Type it in the, I'm getting stronger, somebody, come on. I love, I love, now obviously that Psalm 84 is beautiful. We, you could read the whole thing. It's such a beautiful song about the, the pilgrimage, but, but a lot of you know probably more well the most popular psalm, Psalm 23. Let me, let me show it to you, and then we're going to study it, and I want to show you how to, what to do to go through, what do you do when you're going through a valley? Psalm 23 says it like this, the Lord is my shepherd. Jesus tells, tells us, actually, in the New Testament, John 10, he, he, he told us, I am the good shepherd. He revealed himself. He said, that's me. I'm the good shepherd. Aren't you thankful that you have a good shepherd, church? Come on. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He makes me lie down, even when I don't want to lie down. Come on. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths for his name's sake. And then he says, but even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. You are with me, God. So if you find yourself in a valley, whether now or, or in the future, what do you do when you go through the valley? Number one, draw close to the shepherd. Draw close to the shepherd. You see, the shepherd is not interested in a long-distance relationship with you. The shepherd is not along. He enters the shadow with us and can even use those shadow moments to draw us closer to him. Isaiah 43 says it like this, that when you go through deep waters, God says, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you, when you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, and I am with you. I am your Savior. You know, you're as close to God as you want to be. You're as close to God. And some, some, some of you may be using this valley, this pain, this loss, and this grief, or this disaster, or this circumstance as an excuse to get you distant from God. And I'm telling you, it's a lie of the enemy, because the enemy will li- whisper to you, and he'll say, you're alone. You've been left to fend for yourself. Hey, the shepherd wouldn't lead you here. Why would the shepherd lead you to this place? You're alone. You've got to resist those lies of the enemy. James chapter 4 says it like this, verse 8, draw near to God. And he will do what? He will draw near to you. See, in the valley, it's, it's what we often do the opposite. In the pain, the problem, in the valley, we resist the shepherd. Don't resist the shepherd and don't blame the shepherd for your valley. Don't blame him. Remember, you don't have his perspective, but you do have his promises. I'm telling you, the journey will be much more bearable if he walks beside you. 
instead of you walking 10 steps behind him, criticizing and complaining along the way. Come on, how many of you know that's your sweet spot right there? That's your sweet spot. You, you'll go on the pilgrimage, but you're just 10 steps behind like, this sucks, man. I, I don't want to go. Okay, fine. Okay, fine. Okay, fine. You're just kind of always catching up. Okay. The, I'm t- look, the pilgrimage, the journey from strength to strength, the journey to where God wants to take you is so much better if you walk by his side instead of complaining 10 steps behind. So draw close, draw close. And when you do draw close, number two, talk to the shepherd talk to see when david got in the valley he stopped talking about god and he started talking to god well there's a big difference some of you are comfortable talking about god comfortable talking about the bible and talking about god and going to church there's a big difference between talking about god and talking to god it's the same like there's a difference between believing in god and believing god Come on, somebody. Because he begins, he begins the psalm like this. In Psalm 23, he leads, he guides, he restores. But as he goes through the valley, he says, For you are with me, your rod and staff come for me. It's no coincidence that he changes his language when he goes through the valley. See, it's those valley experiences that let you know you serve a personal, close God. So draw near. And don't just talk about him. Draw near and talk to God. Talk to him. He wants to be close to you. He wants to be close. Psalm 34 says that actually he's never been closer to you when you're in the valley. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And he saves those who are crushed in spirit. It's when we're in the valley, in the shadow of death, that we're in the darkness, we're in the shadow time. We say, man, God can't be here. There's no way. I'm so far away from God. Look, just because it's dark doesn't mean he's not there. Let me say it like this. Don't equate darkness with distance because God is with you in the shadow. Amen, somebody? The psalmist says, whether I make my bed in heaven or in the depths of Hades, I will never leave your presence. Meaning no matter what's coming after me or where I am, God, I cannot run from you. Draw close to the shepherd and talk to him when you're in your valley. Draw close and use your voice. Talk to him. And then number three, you need to go on a treasure hunt, church. You need to go on a treasure hunt. What does that mean? See, God is able to redeem anything that a disciple of his goes through. Any valley we go through, God can enter it with us. He can bless us and change us so that we look more like Jesus. How many of you know that's treasure right there? That's treasure. Think about how a pearl is formed. How a pearl. A a grain of sand makes its way inside of an oyster's shell in the crack of the shell. And in response to the irritation, there's secretions and coatings from the oyster produces a pearl. All oysters do not produce pearls. Pearls, only the ones that recover from the irritation and the wound. See, a pearl is basically a healed wound. No wound, no treasure. See, what's the Bible say about this in First Peter? What does Peter have to say about this? These trials will show something. This valley is going to show that your faith is genuine. It's being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than a measly pearl. Your faith is far more precious than gold. So he says, when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You see, you got to dig For the treasure in the valley, you're looking at your problems on the surface. You're just staying on the surface, but God wants you to go deeper to find the treasure, to find what he wants to do inside of you in the valley. Can I get an amen? We may never fully understand, but in his grace, we get a glimpse of how far that we've come and how far he's brought us. In fact, one day you may look back and you may thank God for the valley. Not that we would ever want to go through it again. Or wish it upon anybody. But that we'll look back and realize that we're in a better place. Because the valley that I, that I endured. Because the pilgrimage that I, that I went on. 
Here's the next thing you do. When you find yourself in a valley, keep walking. Keep walking. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, keep walking. Keep walking. Keep Keep stepping. Don't stop, okay? The word in Psalms is through, through the valley. The place of shadows is not a permanent dwelling. It's not a permanent place. See, when the darkness closes in and you don't know what else to do, just take the next step. Just take the next step. Hold on for a little longer. Keep walking. Even if you got a limp, keep walking. Don't quit. Don't stop. Even if you got to drag yourself, keep walking. Keep going. Keep moving. Keep process. Keep going. Keep walking. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Passion Translation says, For we live by faith, not by what I'm seeing in this valley. It don't look pretty. It don't look good. We live by faith, not by what we see with our eyes. You keep walking by faith, not by sight. You cannot afford to analyze why you had to enter the valley. Anyone ever got, get caught in that thing? Why? Any of you ever thought, like, if I just knew why I was going through this, I could, I could endure it better. If I knew the purpose of this thing, it would be so much easier. It wouldn't hurt so bad. We think that, right? We think if we could understand the greater purpose, the greater plan for our pain, then it would be easier to endure. Can I tell you something? God has never promised you answers. In fact, you don't need it. Look, you, you don't need answers to get through the valley. You need faith. That's what you need. You need faith. Let me say it this way. To go through the valley... You need a faith that chooses to survive what it cannot explain. That's what you, you don't need explanations and answers. You need a faith that rises above understanding. God never did explain to Job why he went through the valley of deep darkness. That phrase, valley of deep darkness, is mentioned nine times in the book of Job. Job was actually on the right path, was a righteous man, and he never got the why, the explanation of why he had to go through the valley of deep darkness, so keep walking. Set your heart on a pilgrimage. Set your heart on getting in the presence of God. There is a better place, and the shepherd promised he'll take you there. Keep walking. And one more thing, number five, praise him through the valley. Praise him through the valley. Matt Redman was interviewed about his song, Blessed Be Your Name. I don't know if you've heard that song. It's a popular song. It was written in the weeks following 9-11. He said, it's really a song born out of the whole of life, a realization that we will all face seasons of pain or unease. And in these seasons, we will need to find our voice before God. Isn't that? It's not true that when you go through the valley, it's like the enemy takes your voice. It's hard to cry out. It's hard to pray. It's hard to worship. It's hard to ask. It's hard to, it's hard to do it in the valley. And we have to, we have to find our voice and worship God and praise God through. It's, Psalm 50, 23 says it like this. God says, it's the praising life that honors me. That's what I seek. That's what I, what I want. I don't, I don't want your sacrifices. He says, I want your heart. When you start praising me, that's what gives me honor. And I love what he says, as soon as you set your foot on the journey, as soon as you set your foot on the pilgrimage, when you're not stuck, when you don't stop, when you don't get paralyzed in the valley, as soon as you set your foot on the way, I'll show you my salvation. I'll come alongside you in your darkness, in your despair, and in your grief, and in your pain. I am with you. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 gives us this promise. He says, all praises, come on, all, no matter what the circumstances, all praises belong to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he is the Father of tender mercy, and the God, he never gets tired of comforting you, of endless comfort. He always is a good shepherd. He always comes alongside, doesn't he? Hey, it happens when you praise. He comes alongside us and comforts us in our suffering. 
He says, so that, here's the purpose that your comfort is, so that we can come alongside those who are in any painful trial. We can bring them the same comfort that God has poured out into us. How many know that's a lot of comfort that God has? The shepherd's presence in the valley is what changes everything. See, God doesn't promise the absence of valleys. He promises the presence of the shepherd in the midst of them. I don't know if the valley experience and what your valley is, whether it's the valley of grief, the valley of loss, the valley of trouble, the valley of difficulty, I don't know what specific valley you're going through, but I know that God has a purpose, not just for the mountaintop experiences and the successes and the great victories, but he's the God of the valley. And if you let him, he can make treasure. He can develop a pearl from your pain. Amen, somebody? Come on, will you bow your heads all across every campus? Will you bow your head online with me? Can I have the campus pastors come on up to the stage and love to pray with you right now. No, I don't know what you're going through and what the valley is. God does. And God wants to come alongside you right here, right now. Some of you have been walking 10 steps behind, complaining and grumbling. Some of you are not even 10 steps behind. You took an alternate route. Come on, you know who you are. You took an alternate route. You went away from the plan, from the presence, the person, from the pilgrimage, the journey. You got upset. You said, this journey ain't no fun no more. Come on, you know who you are. Some of you have never been on the journey to get to God. Can I just, I want to start right here. That, that if you're here today, and you're listening, but you've never given your life to Jesus, this good shepherd who wants to come alongside you. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and, and we believe that God raised him from the dead, then we shall be saved. Like God will rescue you right now. He, he will give you an eternal place in heaven, a home in heaven and make you brand new. That's, that's, he can come alongside you right now, no matter what. If you're here today and you need that for the first time, or maybe you need to make that decision again, because you're one of those that took the alternate route. You went the different direction. You need to come back to this pilgrimage. You need to come back to the plan and the purpose and keep walking again. You need to rededicate and reaffirm and realign. I'd love to pray for you as well, no matter where you are at in this journey. Come on, let's make a decision right now. I'm not going to have you come up to the front or single you out, but I'd love to pray with you right there, right where you are, and have God, Jesus, the good shepherd, come alongside you right now. With every head bowed, if that's you and you're ready for a fresh start, you're ready to declare Jesus as your Lord, to surrender your life to him and choose to follow him from this day forward. I, I, I'd love for you, in the count of three, I'd love for you to just lift up your hand and I'll pray with you right where you're seated help you with some words for your fresh start. Come on, be bold. One, two, three. Lift up your hand right now. Come on, I need you, Jesus. I want a fresh start right now. Yeah, yeah. All over the place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Come on. Thank you, God. I need you. Fresh start. Yes. Come alongside me. I'm coming back to you. Come on, put your hands down. And if that's you, pray something like this. Jesus, forgive me for getting off track. Forgive me for complaining, for grumbling, for getting sidetracked to the valley. Today, I surrender my life to you and I give you control. I make you my Lord. I choose to follow you. Come live inside of me and make me brand new. From this day forward, God, help me to serve you, to live for you. Change me, God, from the inside out. God, I speak over every person who's going through valleys. We all are. We all have valley experiences. God, we need you. Help us to persevere, endure through the valley, God. You're not just the God of the mountaintop. You're the God of the valley, and you have purpose in this season. You're doing things underneath the surface, so God, go deep. God, go deep into our hearts. God, go deep into our character. God, go deep into our faith, God. Do what you need to do to align and to adjust and to make us more like you, that from the testing of our faith, that it would produce a refined gold, that pearls and treasures, God, 
will be the result of our valley. We choose to keep walking, to trust you through it, to praise you through it. We thank you that you're a good shepherd. You walk with us in the shadow in every valley. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that word.